All right, so here's the intro for YouTube. So a lot of people who start puppet building, um, one of the first things they learn is that there are certain materials that most professional puppets are made out of. Um, this is going to be a recap from Friday, basically. Uh, but um, at any rate, I, need, I should go over it again because this is going to be for YouTube. So when people get into puppet building, um, you find out that there are certain materials that most professional puppets are made out of. Um, and specifically two materials uh, that are commonly used. One is nylon fleece, um, which the brand name is now Nyla fleece, often referred to as Antron fleece, although that is technically incorrect. We'll we can get into those details momentarily, but you will often hear in puppet building circles um, about Antron fleece. What is called Antron fleece or Muppet fleece nowadays is just uh, is Nyla fleece. It's nylon fleece under the brand name Nyla fleece. And that is the stuff that is most commonly used for puppet skins. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, let me grab some and I'll, I'll give a demonstration here. Let's see, maybe we should go to the top cam. So, this is a bit of Nyla fleece. This is not a great camera to do this with. Maybe we'll go to this camera. Hey there. It's a little weird having a camera behind me, but you know. Um, I was singing at home. I write a lot of shows thinking of writing two puppet shows. One musical, one comedy show, and one magic show. Nice. Very nice. That's what I got to get back to. The Oracle is coming back, YouTube, FYI. Definitely. And that's one of the things I'm working on. Uh, off store stuff is uh, building the new Oracle. All right, anyway, so Nyla, Nyla fleece, nylon fleece, which is called Nyla fleece. Um, so this is, a, this is a bit of it right here. Uh, most professional puppets you see are, are made out of this stuff. Uh, the reason that we use Nyla fleece is because it is quite thick. It has a thick pile, and basically it's a netting backing that has fibers stuck into it. So what that means is when you sew with this stuff, you can seam blend. You can pick those fibers out of the seam and you can make the seam less uh, less visible. You can't ever really hide it. There's a, there's a myth about the invisible seam. That's not really a thing that exists. We can even get into that in more detail. But you can, uh, you can make it a much less harsh transition. So that's one of the reasons that we use Nyla Place. And the other reason is that it has a fair degree of stretch. Um, uh, most fabrics that stretch only stretch in one direction, or they have more of a stretch in one direction than the other, and that is true for Nidal Face. Good morning, Zap. How you doing? Um, so, with this little scrap of fleece here, it stretches this way a lot, this way not so much, right? So that is one thing you need to pay attention to when you're building a puppet is which what's the direction of your stretch. And the reason that we need to do that is because it's good to stretch this fleece. You see, just sticking my thumb out there, how nicely it kind of conforms to curves and things. So when you're stretching this over a structure of some kind, usually foam, um, it kind of lays nicely and, and does what it should do. So that's why we use Nyla fleece. Um, now, the question is, do you have to use Nyla fleece? <clears throat> uh, and the theory that I am exploring <laughs> with this is that no, you don't actually need to use Nyla fleece. Um, I should have took at this camera here. Um, as I said, the reason that we use Nyla fleece is because of the fibers and because of the stretch. And there's other kinds of fleece that will do similar things, just not quite to this degree. But you don't really need it to this degree. And the problem with Nyla fleece is there are literally two places. Uh, I totally see 3D printing in your future. We'll see. We'll talk. We, 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 I've been thinking. <laughs> um, there's two places to get Nyla fleece. Uh, one is uh, uh, Puppet Pelts, and the other is George's Stage. Both fantastic places I've ordered from both. They're great. But the thing about this is, it can be kind of pricey. 
And that's just a reality, right? Like it's just, there's a reason for it. This is all custom dyed. There's only like, there's a limited supplier, there's a limited manufacturer of this. So of course it's gonna cost uh, a considerable amount of money. And it's, it, there's a reason for that. It looks fantastic. It works really well. This is the stuff. This is the primo stuff you wanna use. However, it might be a little cost prohibitive for some people. Um, and so what you can do is uh, you can go and get other kinds of fleece. Now, the kind of fleece that you would normally find, let's go back to this camera. The kind of fleece that you would normally find at like uh, a, a big box, like a fabric store kind of thing, that's usually either called polar fleece or anti-pill fleece. That's the stuff you want to look for if you're looking for a budget option for a puppet skin. And let me grab some here. Here we go. So this is polar fleece. Um, again, bad camera. <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff that you will get from, you know, just an average uh, fabric store. And, you know, it has a lot of the same or at least similar properties to nylon fleece. It's got a fiber texture. So you could blend the seam. It's got stretch in one direction, but not as much stretch in the other. Probably actually this one has none in the other direction. So this, you really have to pay attention to the direction of the stretch on this. But I mean, the main difference is, uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to show this terribly clearly, but let's see. I'm gonna try and show like a cross section of the two fleeces. I hope that autofocus behaves. Yeah, kind of, yeah. So you can see that the green Nyla fleece is considerably thicker a pile than the purple polar fleece. And so that's why you would, if you have the option, you'd pick the Nyla fleece over the polar fleece. But that doesn't mean you can't use the polar fleece. You just have to be a little bit more finicky and you have to be a little bit more patient with it. Um, but you absolutely can use this. And I've made puppets out of this, um, but I've never made a whole puppet out of this. And that's, that's the experiment for uh, this video series. Um, and the other thing is the kind of foam that you use. <clears throat> and this was something that drove me nuts uh, when I first started building because like everyone would tell you the, the, the right foam to use for professional puppets is it's called either reticulated foam or Scott foam, or sometimes it's called filter foam or dry fast foam, but it's a, a particular kind of uh, open cell foam that's very low PPI count, which is like pores per inch. So it's the bubbles are big basically. Um, and that's what you should, should use for professional puppets. The one answer that I could never find anywhere was, why? Why why this foam over, say, any other kind of foam, like upholstery foam, is a very commonly available type of foam. Um, and I eventually found the answer, but it was not easy. So I'm gonna tell you the answer here now. Just, I don't know why it's such a secret, but it's not. Um, uh, <clears throat> Scott foam or, or reticulated foam, because of the pores, because the pores are so big, um, what will happen is like on a professional puppet that gets used a lot, um, you've got a human hand in there doing stuff. That hand's gonna get hot and sweaty. It's gonna be a warm, moist environment inside that puppet's head. And reticulated foam uh, actually wicks away moisture. So it, it won't absorb the moisture, it will sort of let it evaporate out. Um, and so your puppet will last longer under heavy use if you use reticulated foam. Uh, and that's really it. Um, it just doesn't break down as quickly under load, you might say. Uh, a solution stick an air conditioning unit under the puppet. You know, there are there are a lot of puppets that actually have built-in cooling systems, particularly like big walk-arounds. Um, you absolutely need that, otherwise your performer is gonna hyperventilate and die. <laughs> so, you know, that's to be avoided. Um, but uh, nevertheless, that's why reticulated foam is preferred for professional puppets. That is the case, but it also means that you don't need to use reticulated foam. Uh, you can use a much more commonly available foam, which is polyfoam. Actually, let me show you the difference here. Uh, I got some scraps under here. 
So. so yeah, this is probably good. This little piece here is reticulated foam or Scott foam or filter foam. It comes under a bunch of different names. I actually find it um, at foamzone.ca, not getting any kickbacks, but um, under marine foam that's used for like cushions for boats and things like that, because of course it's gonna get wet and it needs to wick away moisture. It's used for like outdoor cushions quite a lot, but let's see if we can get a real good, yeah, look at that, that's great. Um, so there's what reticulated foam looks like close up. And you can see it's really big open pores. Uh, this stuff is also kind of uh, scratchy and it feels kind of plasticky. Um, but that's what you normally want to build a professional puppet out of that you know is going to get a lot of heavy use. However, uh, this stuff can be tricky to find and it can be a little expensive. <laughs> I hate it when the performer gets cooked in a giant bird suit and dies. That's not how Carol Spinney went, I promise. This stuff, this is upholstery foam or just poly foam. You can get this at most like big uh, fabric outlets or even a Joann's or a Michael's. Um, and as you can see, when I put this up, the pores are much, much closer together. It's much more dense. It's also because of that, which it seems counterintuitive, but um, it's, it's very soft. It's very kind of gentle and soft and it's very cushiony and it feels nice. Um, but this stuff, because of that, it's, it's gonna act like a sponge basically, right? So if a puppet is under heavy load, it's going to uh, need repairs more often than it would if you make it out of uh, Scott foam. And that's really it. That's the only difference. Um, other than the fact that um, the, the stiffness of reticulated foam tends to be a little bit more than um, upholstery foam, but that's not really an issue for most puppet builds. And uh, upholstery foam generally, generally is way cheaper than Scott foam. So uh, the goal of this build is to make this puppet with as many accessible materials as possible. So not Scott foam, not an idle place. We're using polar fleece, we're using upholstery foam. We're using materials that you could go either to a craft store or a fabric store or something like that and get, or just order online, um, and that are, are inexpensive and accessible and readily available. That's the point of this build. Um, because I think, not only the cost, but the kind of exoticness of the materials can be a bit of a barrier for people. And I totally understand that. So we're going to show how it can be done without having to go to those extremes. Uh, since the underlying structure or how it's accomplished would be a great thing ventilation wise. Yeah, well, that's it's always a problem, right? And this is one of the things that I think a lot of people don't quite get when they start getting into puppetry and puppet building is like puppets. Uh, all have a lifespan, right? Because they're physical objects and because they're made out of soft materials that are constantly getting used, they're going to break down. Like so eventually something's gonna happen. You're gonna have like little tears. Or Over time, it's going to need to be repaired and sometimes it's gonna have to be replaced. They are perishable goods in a sense. Now, some puppets can last 20 years and without a problem. It really depends on how it's used, how it's built. Um, but eventually they all need some TLC because it's you, just the fact that you're using uh, foam, eventually foam will break down. And so there is, a, there is a ticking clock on every single puppet that you build. Uh, and that is something to be aware of and just know like so if you're building puppets for like a professional production part of the process of doing that is knowing that you're going to have to repair these as the production goes on and so you build them uh, with the ability to open them up and repair them and, and put them back together just knowing that going in is an important thing but that's the thing yeah, they all go to the island of broken toys it's true um, but you know, with 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 care, you know, there's, they can last indefinitely. I mean, I know, for example, the the fraggles that they're currently using on the new Fraggle Rock stuff, um, the skins are the same as they had these uh, what are called poser puppets, these um, or photo puppets. They're just they're not actually they weren't actually puppet puppets. They were they had like armature inside, so you could pose them and things. Um, but all of the foam inside had just uh, disintegrated completely. 
And so they had to make new foam to go in those skins, but the skins are still the same. So like you can, you know, you can keep a puppet alive as it were, but it does require work and they all will eventually require that. So that's a long way of saying um, that we should probably get to work. I did a little bit of work beforehand. Let's go to the, the actual camera. Oh, what's what now? Ah, okay, this is hilarious. Check this out. It, it didn't like your and your. Like with you, put, that's how you spell that word. Actual Kevin is spelling your correctly. That he gets internet points for that. <laughs> your puppet orthopedic surgeon. Well, kind of. Um, some of it actually can be a bit like surgery when you're when you're working. I don't know. I don't, it's auto mods. Auto mods gone crazy. Auto mods gone complete. Like uh, you know, language is hard. I don't know. Auto mods. Auto mods gone nuts. <laughs> anyway, um, now at first I thought that what I was going to do for this puppet was I was going to build. Um, one of the lizards that I built the other week. Um, but my goal for this week was to do, I wanted to do this experiment with the, you know, accessible materials, and I wanted to build a Grieve Leaf for the store. And then I realized we'll just do both at the same time, build a Grieve Leaf out of accessible materials. Uh, yeah, yeah, Automod's, Automod's a bit much. I don't know what, I don't know why, it, I guess it maybe it was like a repetition of the word your or something that it caught, I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's what we're building. We're building a Greebly, just kind of fleece Greebly, um, like what we built last time, <laughs> but we're building it with accessible materials. So the first thing we gotta do is the mouth plate. Uh, I got a little head start before the stream here. Um, and so I cut the plastic for the mouth plate. This uh, plastic is one of those materials that you can find everywhere. And if you can upcycle plastic, do so, because it's better in a puppet than in a landfill. Um, but things like shampoo bottles, ice cream tubs, um, uh, detergent jugs, um, you can get like a five inch square of plastic out of that. Uh, and you can make mouth plates out of that stuff, no problem. What these are, and I've shown these on the stream before, um, these are ordered through Amazon. These are just flexible uh, cutting mats, like for the kitchen. This has got a fish. This is the one for fish. Um, but these are just, they're thin, flexible plastic, and they're really, really good if you want to make a flexible mouth plate, which I do. Um, and again, these are like a few bucks for four kind of thing. Uh, so you can usually find these either on Amazon or you can go to dollar stores and get these. Uh, another thing I often do is get dollar store like Tupperware storage bins. We were talking about the store, the Rubbermaid storage bin. Yep. Those are really good uh, sources of easily usable plastic. Um, but anyway, so that's what these mouth plates are made out of. Now, one thing I have found with most plastics, but this plastic in particular, is it doesn't necessarily take glue very well um, because it's a non-porous surface. So what you want to do is you want to roughly sand. Uh, so that's what I've done with this, roughly sand it. <clears throat> but it's still not the best, particularly if you're making a flexible mouth plate that's going to get sort of crunched up and used a lot. I, I like to add a little bit more of insurance. Uh, and so what I do is I laminate the mouth plates between two layers of fabric and that really helps because fabric takes glue really really well this is a little technique that i pioneered when i made millie the possum uh for sarah berman and it ended up working well and that's what i'm that's what i'm doing with all of my greebly mouth plates now i'm making them that way so um the choice of materials to laminate this with is uh, a, a topic where we could talk about accessible materials what i normally use grab some here. I normally use this stuff. If you're a regular viewer, you've seen this before. This is Ultra Suede. This is, happens to be Ultra Suede from Puppet Pelts. But this stuff is amazing. I love working with it because it is, as far as I can see, this is a non-woven fabric. And I don't know how this stuff is made. There's no like like uh, weave in here. There's no fibers or something. It's just like a solid sheet. 
it's very much like leather. I mean, that's what ultra suede is, is a, an artificial leather. But uh, it's very, very thin, it's very, very strong, and it doesn't stretch. So it's really, really great for making internal structures. Um, however, this is a, Puppet Pelts is the only place that I found that I can get this particular type of ultra suede. Therefore, it's not accessible. So we can't use it in this puppet. Um, what you can get is this, this is called ultra suede. This particular material was uh, got from Fabric Empire, which is a really big um, online fabric store. They're in the States, but they ship everywhere. Um, but uh, the difference is this stuff is a woven material. And you can see that because it frays. You can see that. It, here we go. Yeah. Well, Puppet Pelts, I mean, don't get me wrong. Puppet Pelts is amazing. Puppet Pelts has done so much for the puppet building community, as it were. Um, I'm not saying don't go to Puppet Pelts. <laughs> Please go to Puppet Pelts. Lori and Cindy are fantastic. You will get the best customer service of your life at Puppet Pelts. But it is... Uh, it is an expense that if you're just starting out, maybe you don't want to, maybe you want to get your feet wet first, right? So that's why we're looking at this kind of stuff. This is way more accessible. Um, I honestly don't remember how much I paid for this. It wasn't expensive though. It was, it was only a few bucks, you know, per yard or meter. Um, but the problem with this is because this is a woven material. Now it has a lot of the same properties. It's good and strong. It doesn't stretch. Um, so it is good to build an internal structure out of, um, but it does fray. So that's something to be aware of. You can use other kinds of materials for internal structures. Um, the, the only kind of guidelines would be that you want it to be strong and you don't want it to stretch. Um, and if possible, you don't want it to fray. So like something like a linen uh, would be fine or even like a... Um, Oh gosh, I don't know. It's kind of cotton fabric. Even like canvas might be a little too heavy, but anything like that that is going that's going to be nice and strong and stiff. That's what you want to build your internal structures out of. And I've already gone ahead and done that with these two. So these are just mouth plates cut to the same size as the plastic ones with the elastic grips glued and sewn onto them. I've, I've done this on stream a dozen times, so that's why I kind of went ahead and did this anyway. Because um, y'all y'all have seen this before. But that's all this is, is just this fabric cut into the right shape with, uh, this is just elastic strapping. You can Again, you can get this at any fabric store or like sewing supplier, that kind of thing. A word about um, craft stores like Joann's or Michael's or that kind of thing. You can get most of this material at those kind of places, but you're going to pay a big markup if you do. I would counsel going to, if you have one locally available, a big fabric store um, or an online fabric store like Fabric Empire. Uh, I get most of my fur from Fabric Empire. Um, they're like a bulk supplier kind of thing, so they deal in big coupons. <laughs> Hello, Lisa Puppets, how are you? Um, you know, I really should have arranged for some... This whole, this whole stream is like telling people what to use instead of puppet pelts, so I should have gone to puppet pelts and went, give me some coupons, Laurie and Cindy. <clears throat> that would have been great. <laughs> anyway, um, so the next step after this uh, is that we're going to make another layer of this, basically. And we want to make it slightly bigger than the original so we can fold the edges over and kind of mummify the whole uh, the whole structure. And this is what I found works really, really great for... i got to stop saying really, really. It's terrible. <clears throat> so I'm hyper self-conscious. Um, it works really great for these kind of flexible mouth plates because this plastic is so thin, this adds just enough of a, of a sort of weight and a bulk to it that you could still do the nice flexible Kermity things um, and it will spring back and it won't like distress the plastic too much. And, uh, better than like and um, yeah, well now, you know, I try, I try not to use the word like as punctuation. You know. <laughs> I know I'm alone in in many cases in that, but it's just 
It's just me. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace out these mouth plates and then I'm going to add like, I don't know, like an eighth of an inch or something. Uh, I'm super guilty of both. Well, you know, practice, right? And that's, the, that's one of the things with streaming that people don't get is that you become hyper aware of your own language. Why is the camera like this? Why are you doing that? Come here. Come here. Behave yourself, weird AI camera. Um, but it's true, you become, you become hyper aware of your own language, right? I think Automobile is quite grunting. It's why it never catches anything, Frankie says. Okay, so, like I said, I'm just going to trace these out and I'm going to add about an eighth of an inch. And then you'll see. Don't really need to add the center lines, but it's a good kind of best practice to always add center lines. Um, and so, to add our eighth of an inch, we have our little uh, seam gauge here. Very handy things. This doesn't have to be much. This just has to be a little bit. Lisa Puppets, I know you're you're streaming soon, aren't you? You're streaming in like half an hour or so. I saw your I saw your notice. So you can see what I'm doing. I'm just adding a little, little edge on here all the way around. And this is so we can just fold this up and just wrap this whole sheet of plastic up in two layers of fabric. Fiddling with a second display at the moment you're on the big screen. Oh boy. Big screen. Oh, I'm glad I shaved. <laughs> I posted a picture on Instagram yesterday and I realized I hadn't shaved before I did it and it was a real big close up of half of my face. And then I instantly regretted it. It looked like I just came off from a three day bender. I promise I didn't. Okay, there's one and trace out the other. There you go, there's your big screen for you right there. Uh, you definitely need a band cam pop <laughs> musicians in a huge close-up. That's a really good idea, actually. I should start doing that. You know what? When uh, when the Oracle goes back into production, you know, in three or four years after I'm finished building the puppets, um, I want to. I'll work out some like some gifts or something like that that could pop up for alerts and things. I think that'll be fun. Completely superfluous, but you know. This is, this is really uneven. I did that poorly. It's okay. It doesn't have to be super accurate. I'm not even, look at this. I'm not even, I'm just freehanding the rest of it. He's cavalier. He's, he's going for it. He's all caution to the wind. YOLO. <laughs> all right, now. One thing to be aware of, since this quote-unquote ultra suede, I don't think it is actually ultra suede, but since this fabric does fray, you want to be real careful as you're cutting it to not kind of pull and, and get little jaggedy edges and stuff. You want to give as much of a clean, sharp cut as possible, and I'm really bad at that, so... Now, thankfully, because of the way this gets put together, the fraying shouldn't be a problem. We should actually be, end up be covering all of the edges, so. But it is something to be aware of. <laughs> That's what he thinks poorly was my way. I'm slow, my work is poor. Well... You know, you keep you keep practicing, and eventually, at least one of those things is going to change. Well, 
Remember always, perfect is the enemy of good. The objective is good enough. I think it's time to either sharpen these scissors or get new scissors. That is one of the things about puppet building is, boy, you sure end up with a lot of scissors. Back me up on this, Lisa Puppets. All right, there we go. This scrap is probably not worth keeping, so we'll check that out. I keep practicing, I'll never work in this town again. That's good to say in the Frankie voice. You'll never work in this town again. Okay, so um, now that I'm at this point, I have a decision to make. One thing about these, I'll post a pick on my Instagram showing my uh, head of the sisters, definitely have at least 20 pairs. Wow, that's more than me. This is this is all I got so far, but I think I need more. You know, I've got like, so I've got scissors I use just for thread. I have the non-stick scissors for cutting things that have adhesive on them. I've got the bulk, I don't care what happens to them scissors. This usually cuts plastic. Um, then I've got these small detail scissors, and then I've got the good sharp shears for fleece and other things like that. That's all I got so far. So you're, oh no, wait, I've also got, hang on. <laughs> that isn't all. Foam carving shears and detail foam carving shears that are curved. <laughs> so yeah, I, we're, I'm getting there. I'm almost there. <laughs> Uh, is that because you need more scissors or because your uh, glass <laughs> your scissors always get to hang out together? Um, a little of both. Well, as you saw, as I went through the list, like you, you tend to want to focus on doing just like one job with a pair of scissors because you, the thing is you need sharp scissors. And so if you're cutting, you know, like sheets of plastic or foam or something like that, that's going to dull your scissors really fast. And in order to get nice clean cuts on your fabric edges, you need sharp scissors. So... You just, you, you have a pair of good scissors. And when I say good, it means you gotta pay a few bucks for them um, that you keep as like exclusive for that, that job, right? And that way it doesn't get dull as quickly. But you do have to, to swap them out every now and then. I don't really have a place where I can sharpen them around here. And it's not terribly easy to sharpen scissors, so. Um, anyway, so this plastic that I'm using for the mouth plate, you can kind of see it in the light. One side has got like this waffle texture on it and the other side does not. Um, and so I like to keep the waffle texture bit for the inside uh, just because I don't ever want this. To, it's probably not gonna show through on the puppet, but you wanna make sure that you've got the waffle, the waffly bit on the inside. So when the puppet's mouth opens, it's all smooth for the inside of the mouth. So start with the top. Uh, basically what I want to do, I could do this either way, actually. I'm going to glue this bit on first. That's T for top. See, this is why you label everything. You learn how to sharpen. Yeah, I do. Definitely. Um, again, this is a bit like the 3D printer. It's like, well, we've got the time. Um, so let's talk about adhesives because that is one thing as we're going through this accessible materials thing that uh, unfortunately there really isn't. Why is the cam the camera's getting the barge into the shot? Good. Um, adhesives are one thing that unfortunately there is no substitute for the good stuff. And by the good stuff, I mean contact cement that is industrial strength. Usually the kind of stuff that uh, shoemakers, shoe repair people use, that's the stuff you want to get. You, it does not have to be barge as a brand. I know the real white cameraman is off, is off doing, what if, what if I turn the, 
it's now looking for human faces and text, apparently. Um, it doesn't have to be barge, but it does have to be industrial strength, not commercial grade. If you go and you get like just, you know, whatever generic brand name, um, contact cement from your hardware store, it's probably not going to be good enough. You do need to get the industrial strength stuff. And I know this for a fact, I have experimented with all kinds of contact cements and there is no substitute for the good stuff. So it doesn't have to be barge, but it can be barge. It can be the stuff called Dual 88. It can be masters. It can be Weldwood. But what you want to look for is stuff that's got um, like industrial uh, applications like shoemaking, for example. Leather stores will often carry either barge or something very much like barge. That's the stuff you want for your adhesive. Nothing else is going to do quite the job at this well. Uh, got into the full synthetic early today. Well, you know, it's Monday. I don't know. Anyway, um, so as always, the safety precautions apply. Only use this stuff in a well-ventilated space. I have a well-ventilated space. Uh, I use Masters and uh, Weldwood. Weldwood, yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for backing me up, Lisa Puppets. Um, yeah, I know it is, it is just a fact of life that it, there is no substitute for... And it's because these things undergo stresses, right? I'll give you an example. I Last week when I was putting together the Sonk Puppets, um, I had you know the good old barge, and I also had a tin of this stuff called LePage, which is a very commonly available brand in hardware stores in Canada. And this was LePage Heavy Duty Contact Cement. Use it exactly the same way that you use barge, put it on both surfaces, let it get tacky, stick it together, press it. Um, I did exactly the same thing. I did one mouth plate with barge and the other mouth plate with the LePage, the barge gluing plastic to foam. That's what I was doing. Um, the barge held no problem. The LePage just lifted right off like there was no adhesion at all. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is. It's unfortunate, but there is no way around it. So if we're gonna do a puppet with accessible materials, the absolute sort of minimum that we need to do is make sure that it's gonna to stick together, <laughs> right? So that's why we use the barge or uh, some other industrial strength adhesive. But that being said, so good ventilation. If you don't have great ventilation, um, then always, Always, always. It's not a bad idea to wear this anyway, but particularly if you don't have good ventilation, get your respirator, wear one of these. Um, I have this because for days when I can't open the window or I can't open the window for long periods of time. <laughs> uh, it's good to have these glues in general. I've saved my favorite shoes among other things so many times. Yep, Masters works on holding the O-Print together. Uh, so that gives you the idea of strength. Yeah, I really want to get, actually, I really want to get Dual 88. That's what um, uh, BJ Geyer uses a lot. And it's, it's, I don't know about Masters. I think Masters is like large and that it's kind of yellow, but Dual is actually clear. So there's some advantages there because sometimes it's like, well, you just, you need to slap something together and maybe a little bit of glue gets shown. If it's if it's do all, then it just dries clear. It just goes away. It's really nice. But anyway, so we gotta stop talking and get to building. I uh, I finally uh, thinned this barge a little bit. I need to get the clear stuff. Yeah. So it's do all eighty eight e u a l l eighty eight. Apparently, there's other numbers of do all, but. Uh, I don't know what they're for, but the stuff that I know BJ Geyer uses for puppet building is Dual 88. I can't get it in Canada, which is unfortunate because um, I'd love to use it. Boy, it turns out this stuff is way easier to spread when you thin it. So we're going to do the top first. Sure, I stirred this up enough, but I guess we'll I guess we'll find out in a second. The nice thing about ultra suede or any of these artificial leathers is they take glue really well uh, and they dry really fast. 
Uh, would I be able to get it and ship it to you, or is it something you can't recall? Yeah, well, that's the problem, is it's like a you know, hazardous material kind of thing. I mean, I, th I probably could get it if I were to, like, fill out a whole bunch of forms and go through a whole bunch of hoops and stuff. I'm a little surprised I can get barge, but thankfully we've got Tandy Leather in Canada, and they stock barge. So, it's okay. Thank you for the offer, but I think it would be more hoops than either of us should jump through. Just for the sake of some glue. I got bar I got barge. I'm good. <laughs> When I finally move to New Orleans, then I'll get to all. Okay. So we're gonna dry this off. I should do the other side now. We'll do one side at a time. Barge is impossible for me to get. I only got masters because they're based in my state. Oh, really? That's interesting. Like I said, I'm only the only reason I'm able to get barge fairly easily is because Tandy Leather. Uh, when you're planning to move south, oh, I, you know, I've been planning to move south for, for a very long time. Unfortunately, it's never going to happen. Uh, it's just a pipe dream of mine. I would love to live in New Orleans. It's my favorite place in the world, but that's just not realistic. I was, I was being facetious. Uh, okay, there we go. So there's one side glued down. So what we're going to do now is we're going to glue the other side. We're going to glue inside these lines. Then this gets laid in like that. And then we fold the edges over. Oh, did the, uh, the NVIDIA, you actually heard the... Uh, I was holding the uh, hairdryer real close. So you probably just couldn't cope. I've also got the fan going, of course. Uh, because I'm working with barge. <laughs> I mean, Lisa Puppets, I'm sure you've checked, and I'm sure I'm being slightly mansplaining about this, but uh, have you checked, like, leather supply stores, like like Tandy Leather? I don't know if you have a Tandy Leather anywhere near you, but I think there were, they'll ship anywhere, if you want a barge. I mean, I think Masters and Barge are pretty much identical. Barge has, has got this, like, mystique associated with it from puppet building, but really, it's not the only, it's not the only game in town. So once again, with the barge, don't use a lot. I know this looks like a lot because it's discoloring, but that's just the nature of the fabric. I'm not using a lot. Very thin, light coats. And uh, I am going all the way to the edge. I realize I need to go all the way to the edge so I can fold it over. There we go. That's good. If we look up, his back up, I can get a massive Kell and jug of barge in my see. There's no way I'm traveling with <laughs> Yeah, I can see. Uh, the other week, uh, my friend Jamie popped on the stream and, and shared a video from Tested.com. Adam Savage visiting, I can't remember the name of the company, they make the big animatronic dinos. And they were doing like, here's how you make a foam sphere with reticulated foam and barge. And the tin of barge that they pulled out was like this gigantic basin. It was like, oh, if only I had that. <laughs> Uh, then I would be doing exactly the same thing as I'm doing now, so I don't really need that. Uh, here we go. All right, let's see if the AI is gonna... I don't know if I hold it over here. The one I saw on this is a huge gasoline cancer. It was huge. Yeah, it was probably the same size. As it was gigantic!
I think I'd be curious, where is Barge actually made? Where's the company based? Wow, that's really, really small fine print. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, here we are. Massachusetts or Maine? I don't know. What's MA? Is that Massachusetts or Maine? Or I don't know. I don't know from. I'm bad at geography. Help me. <laughs> anyway, here we go. We're sandwiching this little thing between two sheets of fabric. And then we're going to go along the edge of the top, put some glue down there, and then we're going to fold it over. Okay. So I'm just going over the top edge here so we have something to glue down onto. Oh, I love having my bifocals, I can't tell you. So I'll only be able to have to wear one pair of glasses. My stream it is real good. So I don't know how far we're going to get today. Uh, my goal is to try and do as much of this on camera as is reasonable, because like I say, I want to put this up on YouTube, so. So we'll see. So now that we've got that, we're going to fold this over. I do have to usually trim this down a little bit, but this makes a nice tight seal. This is the edge that gets glued to the foam, so this kind of gets sealed up. Uh, loving the bifocals. <laughs> you can't conceive the excitement of bifocals. Definitely not. Although it's weird. I never wore glasses uh, my entire life. I only started wearing glasses about, I don't know, maybe five to ten years ago, but it's time. Um, closer to ten, probably like seven years ago. Um, but as a kid growing up, I was always jealous of my friends who got to wear glasses. I just loved glasses. I thought they were they looked great. Uh, which I know is terrible to people who actually were hated wearing glasses. But I was jealous. <laughs> I wanted to wear glasses. Well, your wish came true, kid. <laughs> Enjoy your bifocals. Okay, there we go. So I'm just going to trim off. You'll notice I'm using the non-stick scissors because there's some adhesive on here. Just going to trim off the little fiddly edges. That is not staying down. Let's put some more glue on there and see what we can do. I never needed glasses until I became the worst pizza delivery guy in my town. <laughs> And make sure this is all going to lay down nice and strong. Yes, yeah, so for me it was. It wasn't until you know cell phones became the thing that I. Um, I really like as I was, I sort of have to hold my phone further and further away, and it's like, uh oh, this is like a vision thing. <laughs> I should, I should look into this. I'm not used to this. Also, like, uh, you know, the Kindle. So when I'm reading a book, it's like I kept having it 
up the font size. <laughs> right? And then eventually I went, this is too big. I, I should look into like vision correction, I think. All right, there we go. There's one made. So it's just a nice piece of plastic that's laminated between these two bits of suede and it's it's got a nice amount of flex but it's strong it feels really nice when you put it on it's great so that we just did do it again on the bottom well we're an hour in and we've made one mouth plate whoa <laughs> i've been talking a lot that's important. I mean, it's introducing the YouTube series. Camera, what are you doing? Uh, tell ya. When your technology partially fails you. Um, wait, I want to make sure that I've got the waffle bit on the inside. There we go. I'm doing the inside first. plastic can you use here uh, in keeping with the common material? So this is, this is this. These are flexible cutting boards that I happen to get these on Amazon, but you can get them anywhere. You get them in dollar stores. Um, and they're really good because the, they're plastic that is designed, and I just knocked over my razor blade. Um, they're designed to be flexible. So they're not going to snap in half when you try and move your mouth plate. Um, but they are a little thin, so that's why we're laminating them between these layers of ultra suede. But yeah, these are, these are really easy to find. But as I said before, upcycling plastic is a really, really great use uh, for puppet building. So there's plastic everywhere uh, when, you, when you start looking. There's, like I said, ice cream containers, shampoo bottles, um, we have uh, cat litter, jugs of cat litter. You can get a five inch square of, of plastic out of that. Um, just remember, it's gotta be relatively flat and unadorned, as it were, um, and a little bendy. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, there's some plastic you don't wanna use, like any of that plastic that's really like crinkly, uh, that, will, that will just kind of crumple. You don't want any of that stuff, obviously. You wanna get the stuff, it's ABS plastic. You wanna get the stuff that's gonna like bend and not shatter, obviously. But there's tons of that stuff around. Margarine containers, uh, uh, vinegar jugs, you know, <laughs> lots of things. In the kitchen and the bathroom, that's where you want to look uh, for your upcycle plastic. Um, and like I said, you know, Tupperware containers, or not Tupperware, um, Rubbermaid storage bins, like dollar store storage bins are great. Particularly the lids because there's flat panels. Oh, a little pro tip though. Let me let me get this done and then I'll give you my pro tip for cutting plastic. All right, it's actually not a pro tip, it's just a warning. <laughs> but it's, it's an important warning. I used to buy more ice cream, yeah, exactly. And the food containers will be automatically food grade plastic too. Yes, that's a good point. I mean, not when you put barge on them, food grade no more. But... So, I was, speaking of upcycling plastic, I had a bunch of storage bins from the dollar store that I was using for uh, mouth plates. And it's the kind of plastic that if you apply a sudden impact to them, it can shatter. So I was being very careful and, you know, having to cut it with heavy shears. Um, but it was, it's really tiring on the hand, right? 
so I'm like, I gotta, there's gotta be a better way to do this. So I took the Dremel to it because it's like a, just a big bin. I have one down here, but it's hard to pull out. It's just a big bin that has like, you know, flat sides in the bottom. So as long as, and, but the corners were curved, right? So as long as I just cut the panels out of the sides and the bottom, then that's lots of usable plastic. So I took the Dremel to it. And even on the lowest speed, it, you know, it cuts, but it also melts the plastic. So it was kicking up these little tiny pieces of molten plastic. Now, I always wear eye protection, so I, you know, I was okay. But what I didn't realize until I was done cutting was it had pepper sprayed the entire studio with these little tiny flecks of molten plastic. And it was everywhere. It was all over the cameras. It was all over my fabric. It was all over the window sills. It was just everywhere. This little, little peppering of, of tiny little fragments of plastic. And it, it, I still have some places where it, uh, where it's showing. I've cleaned most of it, but it's still like, don't cut plastic with a Dremel. That's, that's the lesson. Molten plastic shower, what could go wrong? Yeah, that was me just going, ah, I'll just I'll just do this real quick. And then of course it ends up being five hour job of trying to clean up the studio afterwards. Not not great. Don't do it. Not recommended. It would have been much faster if I just got in there with the shears. <laughs> but yeah, I mean I think I think I have yeah, here we go. So here are the panels that I cut out, but you can see all along the edge, all this, like this is melted plastic here. And this is the stuff that was being kicked up and like, you know, sprinkled all over them. As a matter of fact, see this right here? That's the edge of uh, one of my studio lights. See those little white flecks? That's all little flecks of plastic. <laughs> You need a clear plastic tent to do the dremeling and yeah actually you're right if i had you know uh, like a spray booth style kind of a that would have been great but i didn't even think of it so uh lesson learned i won't do that again <laughs> One of those cases where trying to take a shortcut ends up costing you more time than if you just not taken the shortcut. So after this, we'll build the skull. Then we'll glue the mouth plates into the skull, and I think that'll probably be it for the stream. That's probably about right. When the zillions of cardboard boxes we have now. Oh yeah, I've got actually, I made a little spray booth out of a cardboard box for when I need to use um, uh, a spray adhesive. Didn't even think about the plastic. I, think I didn't even notice that it was kicking it up. Like I I get the occasional fleck on my, uh, on my eye protection, but I didn't realize that it was also going everywhere else. <laughs> but yes, that's a very good, uh, very good thought to make a little spray booth for for lots of stuff, like for a spray adhesive or spray paint. If you got to paint inside, um, make a little, little spray booth, just like you know, a little sort of three sided cardboard box that you put stuff in, and then you spray inside that, and the the box prevents stuff from aerosolizing and going everywhere. Got a little glue on the work surface, but that's okay. Clean that up in a second. Like riding a bike with a rear fender in the rain. Yes, exactly. Same physics principle there. One thing I'm learning about this particular 
ultra suede is it just drinks the glue it's just it's too dry by the time i get to actually glue it that's that's very unusual but we can go Okay, here we go. You see, I said, eh, I don't really need the center marks, but they're actually coming in very handy right now. You will always want your center lines. Even if you think you won't, you will. Yeah, look at that, that's so weird. The glue was like, oh, you know what? I didn't, I didn't put glue on the edge. Arr, I'm fine, everything's fine. It's the Monday. After daylight savings time, that's my excuse for absolutely everything I do wrong today. <laughs> Movie concept, glue drinker. We're out of ideas. What's next? Uh, just put two words together. Glue drinker. Hat shaker. This is actually a good concept. <laughs> I should save this for the show. <laughs> Just give me a noun and a verb. We'll make a horror movie out of it. Actually, it's not a verb, it's an adjective. Okay, now let's do it the right way. actually doing okay for this. So I was a little concerned that it might not because of its slightly different woven quality versus the other Ultra Suede, but it seems to be holding up just fine. That's a good thing, because I got a lot of this stuff. And I don't have a lot of the other Ultra Suede. And it's also like half the price. Unfortunately, I'm at the point now where I got to start thinking about that. If I don't want to raise my prices, which I don't, uh, I have to start finding some efficiencies. So that's part of what this this little experiment is about. It's about me finding alternatives to uh, the the pricey stuff. I'll still use nylon fleece and things on on you know special commissions and things. But if I can get away with, I get away with. That's the wrong way of putting it. If I can use a more accessible material and still have the quality be the same, that's the goal, right? Um, then I will, and that way I don't have to raise my prices because it's the problem. Prices are going up constantly. Cost of living goes up constantly. So if I don't want to raise my prices, I got to find ways to make the puppets a little bit more affordably. So there we go. There's our, there's our mouth plates. Um, so now the skull. So, let me get these patterns out of the way.
and we'll get our, here we are, Greebly Foam Skull pattern. So we're going to make this out of upholstery foam, which, as I said, is easily got. You can get this kind of stuff at, you know, like a Joann's or a Michael's. It usually is a blue color or a greeny blue color. Aquamarine, if you will. Hi, camera, I'm here. Um, whereas the upholstery upholstery foam is usually just white or off-white, which is a little bit better for our purposes. And it's going to cut a slab of this. And like I said, this stuff is way cheaper than reticulated foam. It just will break down quicker under load. And by quicker, I mean like... Well, I'll give you an example. There's a foam mouth plate inside the Oracle. And the Oracle got heavy, heavy use for about a year. And I, and at the end of that year, I started noticing it was a little bit loose, a little bit, starting to flake a little bit. So you'll get a year of heavy use <laughs> by using upholstery foam. You'll get you know, five years of heavy use with reticulated foam, right? But upholstery foam is just fine. It's like I said before, on Friday, before I started building, I was getting puppets from other builders, professional builders, uh, and building a small collection, which I still have. Um, and I have never got a puppet from another builder that's made with reticulated foam. It's all upholstery foam. Uh, you save the reticulated foam for the stuff that you know is going to be used in a professional production. That's just the reality of it. Okay, so... Trace out our skull here. Make sure that you've got enough space to do that. Now, one thing about cutting upholstery foam versus reticulated foam, I've mentioned this before, but it's worth going over again. Uh, it's much more difficult to cut upholstery foam with a razor blade than it is to cut reticulated foam. And it's because this stuff is much softer and more rubbery. So it just kind of conforms around the blade rather than getting cut by the blade. Uh, so it's a bit of a trial. You can cut this stuff with scissors, but the whole, the whole kind of goal is to get nice, even uh, square angle cuts, which is really, really tricky to do with scissors. Really, really, he said it again. <laughs> so we are going to try cutting with a razor blade. The only thing is, like, if you cut this stuff with a razor blade, you have to change your razor blade very often. Um, I'm not even sure how long. This is not a new blade. I don't know how good this blade is, but we'll find out. Often when I'm cutting out hands, with uh, that are made out of um, upholstery foam, all I will use scissors because then you don't really need to worry too much about the square cuts because they're going to be all like sandwiched together inside the uh, inside the fleece and everything. So the fleece will give them their shape rather than their shape having to be defined by the cuts you make. So this isn't too bad. The really annoying part with trying to cut upholstery foam with a razor blade is when you come to try and bevel off edges. That's really hard. It always, because I guess it doesn't have as much to push against. Where are we at time-wise? Actually, not doing too bad. So maybe we'll 
this might not fill up the two hours, so maybe after this, I'll uh, I'll trace out um, the skin pattern on the fleece. That would be a bad thing to do. Um, most of the actual sewing of the fleece I'm going to do off stream. It's because it's boring to watch, but. So the goal is that to, by tomorrow, the end of tomorrow, I'll have all of the bits that need to be sewn will be sewn. And then on Wednesday, we can kind of go through and hopefully finish it. Uh, we also should make the uh, foam body. Uh, I'm not sure when we'll do that. I wanted to finish this on Wednesday, but maybe we'll maybe we'll let it extend to Friday. We'll see. We'll just see how far I get tomorrow. Like I said, I want to do most of this on camera for the YouTubes. So, hey, yeah, we got, we got the whole thing with the razor blades. Not bad. Okay, so now we're gonna glue this together. Kevin needs a lost. This is a little ZZ Top sounding. It's okay with me. Uh, right, so let's glue along the edges, except leaving the mouth and the neck open, of course. One thing that's nice about upholstery foam and barge is that um, barge actually paints onto this stuff with a brush really well. Particulated foam. You, uh, as we talked about before, the preferred method is the stipple technique. But that's because it's very, um, because the pores are so big, it's easy to get sort of buildups of little gloppy areas. Whereas this stuff is so smooth and uniform that you can just sort of paint it on and, uh, and it's fine. And it glues really well. It fuses together quite solidly. So it's, it's a quite a nice material to work with. It's also nice and soft, so your, uh, your, jo your jaw hinges are nice and loose and, you know, easy to uh, manipulate. One of the things that people often do with their patterns is if they're making a head out of reticulated foam, they'll cut a little circle around the kind of mouth joint, the cheek area, like in here, and they'll put like a little Pac-Man shaped disc of polyfoam, this stuff, uh, in there just because it's a softer material and it helps to kind of loosen the jaw up and let the performer perform it a little bit easier. The build of the gloppy areas is, uh, is just ongoing, I've noticed. Yeah, well, that's that's the nature of, uh, of particularly of this glue, um, not just barge, but any of the industrial contact cements, there's a solvent in there and over time even if the cap is on the solvent will evaporate and it just becomes thicker and thicker and more syrupy and gloppy and uh so you have to thin it down i thinned this barge before we started the stream so all right here we go we doing there? Well, actually, it actually still feels a little bit wet. So I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but what you're looking for in terms of dryness is you want it to be a little bit sticky, but if you touch it, you don't want any to come off on your finger. That's the perfect tackiness. So here we go, just lining up the edges. 
Greedy skulls are, are really quite easy because there's no darts. <laughs> you just can kind of go through and... Line everything up and roll it all together. I think I may have over uh, diluted or thinned this barge. It's not sticking quite as much as I'd like it to. It's still fine, but it's still it's requiring a little bit more TLC. I was talking about personal glob here. It's different. Like, well. Believe me, I'm 52. I know about personal gloppy areas. Look at me being all serious. What's happening? All right, there we go. Our skull is in one piece. So now, we're gonna glue our mouth plates in. I almost, you see that, but I almost by accident did it this way with the strap on the outside because I'm used to making, this is how I did like the lizard and, and the oracles skull prototype because they had to be turned. Greeblies don't get turned, so. You gotta do it like this, smooth part on the outside. This is it, this is where we end up. <laughs> All right, so gotta make sure we put the glue on the right side. Very important safety tip. And since this barge is a little bit thinner than I would like, I'm going to do two coats. Just because. A safety coat. Two thin coats will hold much better than one thick one. I'm way off camera, aren't they? I keep having to like move the camera further out, but then it's just off the table. There's that. So remembering that the straps go on the inside. <laughs> also, we don't want to put glue on the hinge area.
Oh, one thing I should note about the, uh, the non-puppet pelt ultra suede. Sometimes you have to hunt around for it a bit. Sometimes it's not called ultra suede. Sometimes it's just called like micro suede. Uh, I, I have found it in my local big box fabric store under upholstery and drapery fabrics. So, uh, my precious ear holes, what happened? Did, oh, did the AI pick up the air dryer again? You gotta cope. This is part of, part of the initiation of puppet building. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can find a lot of stuff that you wouldn't, that, that, that aren't really like immediately obvious. You just kind of have to dig for it a bit. And a lot of fabric stores are, are focused around like, you know, fashion and couture and stuff, obviously. So they're not gonna be like craft oriented as much. And so you kind of got to poke around and dig for stuff that uh, otherwise, you know, they've got it. They just don't know they've got it kind of thing. <laughs> Or they don't know what it's used for. Like I said, this was under upholstery fabrics and drapery fabrics. Hold your ear holes, actual Kevin. Bottom in first. I think I should put the top in first. I'll put the top in first. There isn't really a reason. It's just kind of whatever you feel at the moment, in the moment. can be a little fiddly, but usually it works out. No problem. There we go. Yeah. This is not a bad skull. As skulls go, I've seen worse. I used to work in a goth bar. Believe me, I've seen worse skulls. giant stories <laughs> all right here we go there is our, our greebly skull not bad feels pretty good um actually feels very good because the ultra suede of course is is nice and feels like suede and the, the foam is so soft that it's like yeah good action on that greebly head right there so there we go, there's our Greeley skull all done. So what we got left? We got like, oh, about half an hour. I think, I think we can get some fleece laid out by then. So, so there we go, all accessible materials. Um, T-shirt idea, this is not a bad skull. Uh, and it's got grips, it's got a really nice action. You can do the Kermity crunchy things. And again, this is all materials that are easily found. 
on the back and says, this is a bad skull. <laughs> it's like the I'm with stupid thing, except for it's... <laughs> Um, so the fleece that I have chosen for this Greebly, let me just make sure we don't have any glue on the surface here, uh, is some polar fleece that I've had for quite a long time. Uh, it's that purple stuff I showed you before. And this is it <laughs> right here. Looks far more intense on this camera than it does in real life. Let me see if we go the puppet cam. There we go. This is closer to the actual color <laughs> than uh, in this insane glowing thing. I don't know what's going on there, but anyway, I do. It's the GoPro. All colors must be saturated because I have a sports camera. You know. Um, so this fleece, like all fleece, has a uh, plushy side and a less plushy side. The thing about nylon fleece is it has a plushy side and a net side, whereas polar fleece, it's kind of it's kind of plushy on both sides, just one is less plushy than the other. So you kind of got to decide, just look at it and go, I like the texture on this side. So this side will be the outside and the other side will be the inside. So this looks to me, you can't, you can't really tell on this camera, the, the resolution's not good enough, but this is a nice, this is a nice texture here. So this is gonna be our outside. So that means that we wanna lay it on the table this way. Now we gotta figure out where the stretch is going. Stretch is definitely going that way. So we want this, this way, we want it horizontal. <laughs> Those exact same sides. <laughs> okay, there we are. Yep, that's exactly right. That's what we want. So let's see our pattern here. The only thing I don't like about polar fleece at this stage is that it's really hard to draw on with a marker because both sides have fleshy fibers on them. Uh, oh, is this the right? No, I've got the wrong... Or do I have the wrong thing? No, I don't. Here we are. This is what we want. Um, so let me see. I'm gonna try... I have a variety of disappearing ink pens. I'm just gonna see if any of these are gonna show up. That's kind of... I can kind of see that. Since the purple will make like a darker purple line. Yeah, surprisingly, unsurprisingly, the purple is not great. So the blue seems to be the only one that's going to make a mark at all. I really don't want to use a black Sharpie. Uh, so we're just going to do this. Oh, and I, you know what? If we're going to do this, what I need to do is double this up. I totally forgot. <laughs> that's okay. We're just going to fold this in half. Make sure we've got enough fabric on the other side to cover what we're doing. It should be good. Remembering that we got to have a seam allowance too. So you know what? Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to do it like this. <laughs> There's a lot of this. I'm not used to working with this volume of fabric before. <laughs> Again, you can get a lot of this for not much money. Which is one of the things I like about it. <laughs> All right, we got our stretch going the right way? Yes, we do. Got to make sure I have enough of a big solid piece left to do the arms. But I don't think that'll be a problem. There we go, nice and flat. And yep, that's the correct side. So, these, I, I helpfully annotate my patterns. The stretch goes this way. 
Um, we are going to sew the two big seams. So this seam here and this seam here is going to be sewn on the machine and the darts are going to be sewn by hand and the mouse plate can be sewn by hand. So, huh. all right, well, we'll try it with this. I don't think this blue is going to show up very well. I may have to resort to the black Sharpie. I don't want to, but we'll just see. So one of the problems with the darker color like this is the disappearing ink markers are all, for obvious reasons, light colored. Oh, I also need to do the sleeve. Ah, that'll be fine. He just, he just realizes now. Nasty thing is like the fibers just kind of move with the marker. They get all like gummy and mushy. And not great. But anyway, let's see what this looks like. Alright, that's not bad. I can see that. I just gotta be able to see it to sew along the line, that's all. Which means I am gonna have to sew this today. Because this is a disappearing ink marker and these lines will disappear. But that's okay, that won't take long. Don't think we'll be doing that on stream, but nevertheless. So the next thing I gotta do is put pins in this. Uh, is that the cricket would free you from this directory? No, I was a fool. Cricket is more work uh, than it saves. <laughs> oh, you know what? I gotta put my um, seam allowances. I forgot it. Oh, where's my daily show? Yeah. yeah, I do. I don't really regret buying the cricket, but if I could go back in time, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> the only thing is really good for in my workflow is like tongues and uvulas and little features like that. Now, that being said, it is very good for those features. But is that really worth it? was like, I don't know, $400 or something like that. Like, that's a lot of money for, for what I use it for. Like, yes, I could cut things like this on the Cricut, um, except putting fleece on a Cricut is uh, a pain and sometimes doesn't work. Sometimes it gets all bunched up and if the mat doesn't hold it right, then you can literally just ruin a whole chunk of fleece. And particularly if you're working with Nyla fleece, that's money down the drain. So, what you need is a supersonic speed water cutting table. That'd be great. Or just a robot that I could say, hey robot, cut this thing. Well, yeah, thanks. I, uh, I'm i gonna go have a pina colada over here. But this, this whole like marker on polar fleece thing is something I'm going to have to get used to if I want to use polar fleece more often. It's, it's just a fact of life. This isn't being too bad. I can, I can see this. Hello, welcome back. Sorry, I haven't been paying as much attention to chat as I normally do because I, I am shooting this for YouTube, so I'm trying to talk a lot. <laughs> well, welcome back.
<laughs> side of the moment back is later, exactly. Isn't that the fried frog powder from Adam with a small change? No, actually, believe it or not, it's not. Uh, although I did get the idea for how to do the body like this from Adam's fried frog. But no, this is, this is a greebly. This is uh, from my head, but yes, it is quite similar structurally to fried frog. Um, I like the I like the fact that when fried frog you don't have a neckline, right? Uh, so I just went. That's a good idea. I'm going to uh, use that idea. But as I said before, all the patterns that I'm showing on stream are either originals or ones that I have altered from their commercially available ones. So I would never show Adam's unaltered fried frog pattern on, on camera. That wouldn't be cool. But that's the thing with patterning, right? Like, you know, a shape is a shape and the pattern for that shape is going to be the same. Uh, no matter which way you do it, so. The, for example, the pattern that I use for a lot of my round head puppets, like the smalls, and my live hands monsters, those are all the same pattern, and I literally just freehand drew it. Just made it like a Pac-Man shape, put a dart in the top, and uh, made it and see what it, what shape it came out like, and I liked it, and went, okay, there we go, done. So, one trick I'm noticing with the polar fleece is that since this is so mushy, um, your lines aren't as precise as if you were drawing on Nyla fleece. So you got to take that into account when you're cutting and sewing. See, this experiment is for me and you. Okay, let's cut this out. I'm just going to rough cut it first so I can free it from the huge bulk. But now this uh, this head from from to down to about here or so, um, that is my standard Greebly head, which uh, was based on a very early pattern that Eric Lau who was on the replica prop forum as ECL, uh, who makes the most beautiful Kermits. Um, he put out some of his early Kermit patterns here. This is kind of it right here. Um, uh, and he has since changed his patterns, but I liked how his early patterns looked. So I took those, he put those up free for everybody to use. So I took those and I kind of played with them and changed them and got it to a shape that I liked. So it is very Kermity, uh, but it is uh, it is neither Eric's unaltered pattern nor is it Adam Kruger's. But this, the way this body shape works here, this dart right here, that is very much similar to uh, Fried Frog. So it was very clever how we did it with no neckline. There's also drawbacks to the no neckline thing as well, um, because it gets it gets kind of wrinkly in that bit, right? Like when you put a body, foam body in there. So I like it for some things, but not all the time. So the other thing I'm learning about cutting polar fleece is it's really imprecise. This is an important thing to know.
So I would say if you're going to use polar fleece, um, A, be aware of how imprecisely it cuts. Try to compensate for that. Uh, and maybe leave yourself a good seam allowance all around. Because I can see it being a problem here where I don't have a seam allowance because I'm going to hand sew this dart. Uh, that's a problem because you get to only so many ways you can craft a puppet like this. Yeah, it is. It is a bit tricky. Um, like I said, the the round head pattern that I'm that I freehanded that I did that after just like seeing a whole bunch of patterns, and after a while, they all share similar properties. Um, you know, like there's a dart here, and the dart is about this big, and etc. and so on. So, like. It's true that after a while, I mean, like this head shape, for example, when you look at it, it is just, it's, it's just like an open circle. Like there's nothing, you know, uh, terribly inventive about it. It's just a circle with a mouth. And yet when you put that together, it becomes very, very Kermity because Kermit's a simple shape, right? All right, I think it'll be okay. I don't want to keep those pins in it, though. So that's the other thing, I guess, with polar fleece. Use a lot of pins. Because that will cut down on the... imprecision and mushiness of the fabric. I got a couple sticking through here that will definitely poke me if I don't clean those up. Oh, okay, we got... Nine minutes to two hours. Can he sew this in nine minutes? Probably. Um, although I don't know if I got the right color f uh, thread. I should probably have checked that before I cut the fleece. But anyway, let's see what I've got. We can go. We can go a little bit over. That's fine. That'll be the last thing. I'll sew these two lines on the machine, and then uh, and then we'll break. But look at this. Ah, as he drops it on the floor. Here we go. That's pretty good. All right. Let's get our foam skull out of the way here. Put it on top of my phone. That way I won't lose it. Excuse me. I guess we'll switch to Oh boy. Am I still streaming? I hope so, because my stream deck just crashed. <laughs> I touched it, a spark went off, and it rebooted. Okay, it looks like I am still streaming. Okay, good. Um, but I don't have the uh, use of my stream deck right now. So, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know what it was, is I shuffled across the carpet and I got... Okay, hang on, let me... Let me see if I can get it back. Give me one sec. I need to switch because I need the stream deck to switch cameras and all that stuff. Well, I don't necessarily need it, need it, but boy, it would sure come in handy. Okay, it looks like looks like it's starting to come back. Eh? Yay! <laughs> we got it back. Whew. That was a scary few seconds. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Back to the important thing, the puppets. Uh, so I may have to thread a bobbin here. Looks like I do have purple. I have a purple, it's not the same purple. And I don't care. I want to mix those colors. So let's get a new bobbin. 
Oh no, this means I have to stand up and go over here again. I may get a spark. <laughs> I'm at the point now where I gotta open a new pack of bobbins. You know what I haven't been doing? <laughs> I haven't been recording. I mean, I've got the VOD on Twitch, I hope, but, uh, oops. You know, I was going to record this for YouTube. Surprise! <laughs> oh, first Monday after uh, Daylight Savings, you say? Uh, static discharges were heavily marketed as a killer science threat in death electronics. Anti-static product marketers. Fact is, static electricity travels around outside the components, not through them. That's why the spark didn't affect your ATEM right now. Well, good. That's good to know. Still, I didn't. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> it just rebooted the stream deck. That's the only thing. I don't know. It was weird. <laughs> And I'm not using the Stream Deck software. I'm having to use this stuff called uh, Companion or something. So it will interface with the ATEM and with OBS at the same time. So I could use one button to like switch cameras and switch scenes and stuff like that. It's very handy, but also has a lot of moving parts. I hope I have enough of this purple thread. <laughs> this could all be for nothing. I'm really getting low on a lot of my thread colors. It's not good. Okay, power on. Here we go, threading the bobbin. One threaded bobbin. Oh, look at all that. that thread is almost completely gone. This may be a waste of time. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, uh, Companion's great. It's still, it's still very much got that open source wonkiness, right? But um, still, I couldn't, I couldn't do this like this without it. Um, darn. <laughs> Just, I may have threaded that bobbin for nothing. Give me a sec. I gotta find some more thread. I hope I have a purple that's close to that. Uh, oh, what do you know? This may be even closer. In fact, I think it is closer. Ooh. This. It's not bad. It'll do. Um, so, thanks, thread, bobbin, purple thing, but, uh, oh well. <laughs> it's definitely not enough thread here to do this puppet, so. Golly. Bielikers. Gee whiz. Other family friendly explicatives. Yeah, we're definitely going to go over two hours on this one. <laughs> That's okay. So I think what I'm going to do, just in terms of this, this video series, I really, really want to finish this Wednesday. Because on Friday, should, should streaming be an option, uh, I want to get back to the Oracle. So that means this puppet's got to be done. I mean, it doesn't have to be done Wednesday, but I would like to finish it Wednesday. That is the goal. So, I still have to make the foam body. That's another somewhat time-consuming bit. Um, when? I guess it'll depend on, I'll try and get most of the sewing sewing done tomorrow. And that includes the arms. 
And maybe I'll even do the hand inserts. I don't know, we'll see. It probably won't take two hours to do the features, but I still want to leave it plenty of room. Okay, let's try this again. Lots of purple. Let's take the yellow out of there that's in there. This is from when we need the the other greebly last uh, last week. Yeah, is it Friday? I guess it was Friday. What is time? Alrighty, Bobbin goes in. Uh, what are the problems with uh, hot glue or fabric glue versus sewing these seams? Well, uh, for these seams, I wouldn't use hot glue at all. That would just be a nightmare because um, it would just be this is too too gloppy. It's too and also hot, right? As the name implies. Fabric glue, I don't think you could get a nice clean edge with fabric glue, right? Fabric glue, I do use fabric glue a fair amount for like attaching features and things like that. But for actually like, you know, creating a nice clean edge, um, the, the same for both of them. It just, it's just too messy, right? I don't, I mean, if you can figure out a way, <laughs> you know, to make a nice clean edge with glue, um, more power to you, but I don't, I don't know how I would do that. Hot and gloppy sounds terrible. Yeah, exactly. Now, that being said, you do not, absolutely do not need a sewing machine for any of this. Um, I use a sewing machine because it's faster, but uh, a lot of times it's actually better to hand sew because you can blend a hand-sewn seam much easier than you can a uh, machine-sewn seam. This is just entirely time. But if you've got, if you're not under a deadline or you've got time, hand-sewing is not difficult to learn and is, is actually results in a nicer seam. So if the machine intimidates you or it's an expense, don't worry about it, you don't need it. Uh, okay, so let me see, how am I gonna do this? I want to make sure that I get a nice, clean, sewn edge. Is that thread being like that? Come on. Sorry, I got a little clean moving. Okay, here we go. Well, I guess I'll just go for it. Yeah, yeah, I've I've gone on at length about my uh, dislike of hot glue. I don't like it. It's very it's useful for some things, but very very few. And you see, also when I'm sewing with the machine, I'm not just I'm not just going through. I'm just I'm doing it in little bitty stages. You can go slow. It's a marathon, not a race, etc., etc. Yeah, hot glue hates human skin so much, you bet. It sure does. Actually, yeah. Uh... 
It's like the craft world figured out a use for napalm. It's terrible. All right, let's see how this did. Yeah, that's not a bad seam. I'll put it up to the camera. There we go, there. That's not a bad seam, that could be picked. This is a really nice texture, I love the little from bumpy, fuzzy texture. Uh, you pretty much want to be wearing oven mitts. Yeah, exactly. And there's the other thing, right? Like joining fabric together with any kind of glue, particularly hot glue, you, you would need so much precision that how, how, <laughs> you know, how would you do that? There may be a way, but I sure don't know it. on the machine it's okay it's like it's like scotty with the engine of the enterprise it's like you just you can feel something's not quite right and i'm sorry i just realized my chair was in the way of how's that how's that a little better of course what it might be is i'm not used to sewing this fabric all right it's going through this fabric much easier than it goes through nylon fleece. deck place through my ring wrong. Yeah, something like that. I could just, I uh, could feel a plasma uh, uh, warp conduit of flux something. I don't know. Star Trek techno babble. My tachyons are emitting. So there is one lesson about the polar fleece. It doesn't, when you go over the edge, it doesn't back stitch very nicely. I'm gonna have to throw a couple of hand stitches in this, but that's fine. Just at the very, at the very end here, it got a little, a little misaligned and it wouldn't, it got jammed up when I was trying to back stitch to, to lock it in place. So injector manifold, that's it. <laughs> I actually, back in the mists of ancient time, wrote a Star Trek fan film, and that was one of the most fun parts, was just writing the techno babble. Uh, never got made, FYI, but uh, I did write one. Okay, well, let's have a look. We're gonna temporarily turn it. Um, actually, no, we're going to trim our seam allowance here. Like I said, I am gonna throw some hand stitches in the, just the very end points. Uh, did you walk Star Trek Continues? I, I didn't watch, I watched like a few minutes of it. I was aware of it. that's the one with, is that the one with Grantee Mahara? 
uh, R.I.P. Uh, as Sulu. Is that what I'm, I'm are we thinking of the same thing? I was gonna do was gonna be all CG. And by all CG, I mean all CG, including the characters. It was a little ambitious. There might still be a trailer somewhere on YouTube. Star Trek Exile, I called it. Yes, Grand Play Two in a couple of episodes. Yeah, yeah, no, that looked fantastic. I mean, the, the amount of effort. I mean, they, you know, a lot of the people involved with that were like Hollywood professionals, if I if I remember correctly. So you know, they just it was a, you know a, an effort of a labor of love, as it were. Okay, so let's just turn this and have a look and see what it looks like. We can start to get an idea of what the puppet will actually look like. Uh, what do you use to switch between camera scenes? Uh, that was a smooth, easy transition. Keyboard, stream deck. So, um, all of my cameras, um, all my physical cam, um, or my HDMI cameras, my actual camera cameras, non-web cams, are um, connected to an A10 Mini Pro, and that gets uh, connected to OBS via um, a piece of software called Companion and companion interfaces with both the ATEM and Stream Deck so that I can like hit one button, change scenes on OBS and switch cameras on the ATEM. Uh, it's, it, it took a little while to get set up, but like, you know, I can do this, and then I got this, and we got this, and I got this one too. But I got no puppet on, so it's kind of weird. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a nice setup to have. Um, it did take a little while to sort of get all the pieces working in sync, but okay. Let's see here. Um, I'm glad you like it. It's a Rube Goldberg machine, kind of. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe, we'll, maybe the puppet cam will be best for this. So this obviously we're not seeing it at its best, but you can see the texture is quite nice. Right now, this seam is obviously really, really obvious, but we can blend this. We can pick that a little bit, and you know, not too much. Um, that's the only thing because we haven't got the fibers to work with. We're not going to be able to blend the seam completely away, but you know, it's a puppet. It's definitely a puppet. I really, really like the texture of this. I actually kind of like the texture of this more than Nyla Fleece. This has that more that nice bumpy quality that the original Antron that the Muppets were made out of has. Um, so you know. It's, it's got a little something, something. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, now is go have lunch. But after that, uh, I'm going to... Uh, Operation probably has an intense setup. <laughs> He's very well. It took him a lot of time to work his head, trust me. It did... Well, uh, like I said before, bef long before I started doing the puppet thing, I was actually streaming board games. So I, I had to figure out a kind of good multi-camera setup that I could have be really flexible and get lots of angles on things and stuff, right? So it, uh, it was... It was a lot of pre-existing stuff um, that I just kind of repurposed, which is good, because it was not wasted money. Anyway... So I think the next step is I'm going to sew these darts together. Um, and then maybe I'll make the hands. I'll do a lot of sewing, and then we'll see on Wednesday where we are. And hopefully we can finish it on Wednesday, but if not, we'll at least get most of the way through it. Anyway, I'm going to go have lunch. So thanks for watching, everybody. I'm glad you were here. <coughs> Sorry, uh... Uh, two ribbons if you if you showed up late and I'm just about to, to head out. Um, VODs are all there, so you'll be able to see where we started and what we're doing. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Wednesday is the next stream. And as always, uh, check me out on social media. I'll be posting pictures of this as it goes. So anything that isn't done on stream, there will be a record of it anyway. And uh, that's that. So thank you very much. And uh, have a good day. And hopefully we'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>